Well, good morning and welcome back, everybody. It's wonderful to see all of you. I truly hope all of you had a time of rest and relaxation with your family. I also hope Santa was good to you also. Now, Christmas is a time of memories, both making them and remembering them. And you might even have traditions in your home about, I don't know, who gets to put the star or the angel up on top of the tree, or who gets to open up their presents first. You know, these traditions may have to do even with singing your favorite Christmas songs. I mean, in my family, songs like Oh Holy Night and Angels We Have Heard On High and Silent were some of the favorite songs that we had. When my sister was about your age, these are the songs that she tried to teach little brother, me, how to play them on the piano. Uh, that didn't actually work out too well, but I still have those memories. You know, our mom would tell us stories about Christmas when she was a little girl, and she would always read us the book, The Night Before Christmas. You know, stories are very important in our relationships with each other. And everyone here, every single one of you, has your own story to tell. And especially in these past nine or ten months, we've all got another chapter in our story here. And so in this, in chapels this semester, we're going to be talking about a story, okay? A story that has changed all of humanity. But before we do that, let's open up in prayer. So if you would, bow your heads with me, please. Father, just thank you so much for each of these students that is here, whether they're in their classrooms or whether they're at home right now. Father, your spirit can be with them no matter where they are. I pray, Lord, that you just lift them up, that you just give them the joy of this new year as we come into it. And as we tell this story of Jesus, Lord, that each student may find out how their story and the story of Jesus come together. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, boys and girls, well, we are going to join Miss Sim for worship, and then I will see you back in just a few moments. Aloha.
Welcome back, everybody. It is so great to see you again. So, as I said earlier, we all love to hear stories. You know, when you were a little boy or a little girl, your parents would tell you stories about cute little animals. Maybe, you know, Mopsy and Flopsy or Where the Wild Things Are, The Giving Tree. Some of my favorites were One Fish, Two Fish, Red Fish, Blue Fish. And who can forget that classic of Green Eggs and ham. You know, a lot of these storybooks had very colorful pictures in them so that as your parents would read to you, you could almost see in your imagination what was happening in this story. And they had really great pictures in the books also. Now, as we all get older, we start to have a wonder for books and the stories that they're tell and the stories that they tell. You know, there are chapter books, uh, there are short stories, there are novels. And you would form connections with these characters. And sometimes you would read an entire series of books focusing on this same character because it was almost as if you got to know them, that this character had become a friend of yours and that you honestly care about who they are. Okay? Now... There are other types of stories, and these are the stories that we have in music, poetry, art, or film. And in some cultures, their entire history is contained in stories and legends handed down from one generation to the next. And today, we, you and me, are going to start a story, and it is the greatest story ever told. Now, it has been a number one bestseller for not just years, not just decades, but generations and generations. It has outsold the Harry Potter books and also outsold every one of the Narnia books or any other book that's ever been printed. Hundreds, if not thousands, of movies and films have tried to capture the essence of this story. And there's not even been a social media influencer that has had the influence of the lead character in this story. And the story is still continuing. The story is still continuing. You and me, we are all characters in this ongoing story. But the first thing that we have to do with this story, and we've got to be careful about this, is we have to start from the beginning. We have to start from the beginning. You know, have you ever walked into a movie theater and the movie's already begun? It might even be a third or a halfway through, and you have just missed so much contact that you keep asking the person next to you, hey, what's happening? Hey, who's that? You know, 
Why is he so mad? What's going on here? And you're trying to get all these answers to the questions. You know, usually, like in the Mission Impossible movies, the mission is given right up front in the movie. And if you walk into the movie late, you're not going to have any idea what the plot is about. And so we have to start from the beginning. We have to learn who these characters are. We need to learn their background. You know, in the Bible, the beginning of this story is actually the beginning of all things. You know, God's creation and how he made this wonderful universe and this beautiful earth. This is what we call perfection. But soon after the story begins, we see escalating evil. As the first humans decide to follow their own selfish desires, instead of being obedient to their creator. And God then begins his rescue plan, his rescue plan through Abraham and Abraham's descendants. Then, about 2,000 years ago, which is not all that long in human history, God sent us Jesus, a person who would not just change all of history from that part on, but he would change hearts and he would change lives throughout all eternity. And the beginning of the story, the beginning of the story of Jesus is this. And if you have your Bible, please turn to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verse 1. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verse 1. And what Luke says here is, Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Now, this might just sound like some kind of introductory sentence to you, but it's not. You see, every single word in the Bible, every single word is there for a very specific reason. And the story that Luke is going to tell us is a story that many, many people have already talked and written about. And see, this story is just so vast and amazing that even writing about it is overwhelming. You know, seriously, guys, how can you put everything that Jesus did into simple words? How can you put everything that Jesus did into simple words? You know, sometimes words feel weak or just vapid um, when we're trying to describe something totally awesome. You know, think about the first time that you went on a crazy ride at Disney World or some similar theme park. You know, it could have been a roller coaster that has no floors, did corkscrews, or did loop-de-loops. You know, it could be the haunted hotel. You know, you get off of this ride, and someone's just looking at you. It's like, how was it? What was it like? And all you can say is, oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. And you say it over and over again because there's no way to describe that experience in simple words so that another person is going to totally understand what you're saying. And so you just read, start repeating, saying, it was awesome, oh my gosh, that was crazy. And so we have to use words a little bit better. Or maybe you've taken a trip to the Grand Canyon or to one of the vast national parks and you had these pictures that you're taking of say Yosemite Valley and you know you're looking around and it's like you cannot take it all in because it's just so vast and you take pictures and you take your selfies and you know the whole family gets in on this thing and then when you get home about a week later or something and you're looking at these pictures you know it just doesn't have the same effect as being there, you know, or, or, last example on this, maybe there was a new food you just tasted, and it is the best thing that you have ever put into your mouth, and, I mean, as you're eating it, you're thinking about, where have you been all my life, and, you know, you're trying to explain this to another person, you're trying to describe how good it is, but you can't, and so all you can do is, instead of describing that to them, you have to give the other person a taste so that they can experience it themselves. 
And this is what it's like when we come to the story of Jesus. Even Paul, the Apostle Paul, when he wrote to the Romans in Romans chapter 4, verse 17, he tells us, taste and see that the Lord is good. Because, see, when it comes to the message of Jesus, it's not just words that bounce off of our heads, but words that we need to receive as if they're food, words that will become a living part of us. Taste and see that the Lord is good. You know, we want others to taste or to experience God's grace and love. You see, God's nature is difficult is difficult to explain in simple words. You know, many people of Luke's time had tried, and many people had found <clears throat> that words are not enough. But, you know, when words are all that you have, you must paint well with them. And these first words are very important. They have to get the audience attention right away, or people will turn away and Turn it off, so to speak. You know, <clears throat> we have different stories that we have in our English literature world, you know, and they have these first lines in them. Uh, the first line in Moby Dick is, call me Ishmael. You know, we have the whole Star Wars thing that begins, in a galaxy far, far away. Or, you know, you'll have fairy tales. You know, once upon a time, or one of my favorites. It was a dark and stormy night. And you know, when you read the first words of any type of literature, a lot of times you can pretty much tell the genre or the type of story from that very first line. You know, you're going to be able to tell, is it poetry? Is it fantasy? Is it mythology? Is it horror? Is it a fairy tale? And these words from Luke, who, by the way, Luke is a very well-educated doctor of his day, these words, that Luke, Luke, use, these words that Luke uses are well chosen to begin this story, this amazing story. And these words that Luke uses are similar to the oath that a witness in a court of law would say. You know, it's like, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Oh, yeah. And this is how Luke continues in Luke chapter 1, verse 3. And Luke says, I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning. I, too, decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things that you have been taught. So, the first question then is, what did Luke investigate? Well, let's imagine that you're living in first century, the first century Roman world. And it's actually quite a civilized era in history, very much like our world today, but without all the electricity and technology. I know it's a big thing, but it's really a very advanced society in the Roman era. Now, people are talking about a man who lived in Israel, who <clears throat> some are calling the Christ, the Savior of Israel. Now, this Christ is said to be the man foretold by ancient writings of the Jewish people, you know, scholars and Educators and rulers are all aware of these prophecies. <clears throat> but most had no reason to think that they're true. You know, some people were just saying, oh, that's a bunch of old prophecies thousands of years ago. It would be much like, you know, the, pro the prophecies that we have of Atlantis or the prophecies that we have of Nostradamus or the prophecies of the ancient Aztec civilization telling us when the world is going to end and all of that kind of stuff. But there is this man whose name is Theophilus who has heard this story about this Christ, about a rabbi who was able to heal people and even to bring people back to life. 
And he teaches, this man teaches, as Christ teaches, not just the law of God, but the love of God. But, you know, think about it. If these things were happening in our day, you know, come on. You know, you would be thinking that no one can do the things that Jesus is doing. You know, if you saw a YouTube video that someone had been brought back to life in this YouTube video, you would know that it's a hoax or a trick of some kind. But what if, what if your best friend's grandmother passes away? And, you know, they go through grieving and sadness and all of that. And then a couple of weeks later, you go over to your friend's house and there's grandma, and she's laughing, and she's having a good old time. Um, I don't know about you, but that would, like, really freak me out. And I would want to know, uh, what's going on? Um, I thought she passed away. Um, what's going on? And Theophilus is the same way. You see, people are telling him that Jesus rose from the dead after being crucified. By the Romans. People have seen him and heard him. And there are these disciples, Jesus' disciples, going out <clears throat> and healing people and teaching them that Jesus really is the fulfillment of all these ancient prof prophecies. That this Jesus really is the Christ or the Messiah. That he really is the Son of God. So Theophilus hires Luke as an investigator, like a private investigator. And as I said, Luke is not Jewish, so he's not biased in this investigation. He's got no skin in the game. This is a totally unbiased God. Theophilus is saying, okay, go find out. Is this true or not? Is this true or are people just messing with me? So Luke starts investigating. And he starts to ask questions. Now, just a question for you. If you were Luke and you were going to be investigating this whole Christ thing, this whole Jesus thing, who would you want to talk to? And just think about that for a second. If you were doing this special investigation on Jesus, you know, just a few years after he had been crucified and risen from the dead, who would you want to talk to? You know, people I'd want to talk to. I want to talk to the disciples. I want to talk to those people that hung out with him for three years. Other people I'd want to talk to, I, I want to talk to that man that was born lame, that had two club feet when he was born, and Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up. How did that work out? I want to talk to that guy. I want to talk to the guy that was born blind, and Jesus told, put spit mud on his eyes, and after he washed it off, he could see. I want to talk to Jesus' mom, because... You know, sometimes you can't really know a person until you talk to their mama. I want to talk to the people that were there. I want to know what they saw. I want to know what they heard. I want to know. And I want to know it from a lot of different people. And see, what Luke is going to discover is that Jesus is a person like nobody else that has ever existed before or since. Jesus is... Luke is going to discover that Jesus is a person whose wonder goes beyond mere words. What Luke will discover and what we will see throughout this quarter is a very unique person. The Reverend James Allen Francis, around the year 1900, put it this way. He says, Jesus was born in an obscure village, the child of a peasant. <clears throat> he grew up in another village where he worked in a carpenter shop until he was 30. Then for three years, he was an itinerant preacher. He never wrote a book. He never held an office. He never had a family or owned a home. He didn't go to college. He never lived in a big city. He never traveled 200 miles from the place where he was born. He did none of the things that usually accompany greatness. He had no credentials except for himself. He was only 33 
when the tide of public opinion turned against him and his friends ran away. One of them denied him. He was turned over to his enemies and went through the mockery of a trial. He was nailed to a cross between two thieves. While he was dying, his executioners gambled for his garments, the only property he ever had on earth. And when he was dead, he was laid in a borrowed grave through the pity of a friend. Twenty centuries have come and gone, and today he is a central figure of the human race. I am well within the mark when I say that all the armies that ever marched, all the navies that ever sailed, <clears throat> all the parliaments that ever sat, all the kings that ever reigned, put together, have not affected the life of man on this earth as much as that one solitary life. And this is where the greatest story ever told begins. And now I have a few reflection questions for you. Our first reflection question is, what is something in your life that you have had to wait for? What is something in your life that you have had to wait for? You know, the Jewish people waited thousands of years for this coming Christ, for this Son of God. But what's something in your life that you have desperately had to wait for? Question number two. What is something that you were so curious about that you, you had to investigate it and to seek out an answer? What is something that you were or are so curious about that you had to investigate it to seek out an answer? Like Luke had to investigate the story of Jesus. And third and lastly, if you were Luke and you began your investigation of who Jesus really is and what he really did, who would you want to interview? It might be different than the people I would want to investigate. Who would you want to interview? Okay. Let's go ahead and close in prayer. So if you would bow your heads with me, please. Father, again, we thank you for bringing us all back to this beautiful school. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to learn about you and to learn about Jesus. And I pray, Lord, that these will not just be words to the students, that we may taste and know that you are good, Lord, that you may become a part of us throughout this semester and throughout the rest of our lives. Father, I pray a blessing on each of these students and their families, that you would give them patience and the strength to power through all the challenges that come to them. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. See you next time.